It, it was tough. It was, it was bad. It just kind of like the world coming to an end. <laughs> they always talk about the dust, but I said it was the dirty 30s. It was dirt. <laughs> Recent dust storms and tragedies have brought back memories from one of the most difficult periods in American history. These are Stories from the Dust Bowl. This program is funded in part by the Kansas Humanities Council, a nonprofit cultural organization promoting understanding of the history, tradition, and ideals that shape our lives and build community. Records exist that severe dust storms have taken place for many decades and recently occurred in Northwest Kansas, May of 2004. Kind of started blowing somewhere west of Burlington, Colorado, hit the Northwest Kansas area visibility was very low. And it came up suddenly and, and uh, obviously enough, quick enough that caught the highway, de highway department off guard and highway patrol. And it wasn't until after the two people were killed that they closed the, the interstate. So yeah, that was, it was relatively fast. So again, it was a prolonged period of drought. That coupled with a very severe um, pressure change with a lot of wind that came on very rapidly and there you have all the mix that you need for, for a very significant dust storm. The weather conditions were unique on that day. It's like the weather conditions on 28 May 2004, I think, and so the conditions were right uh, with barren fields, dry, lack of vegetation weather pattern that came through on that day was uh, was conducive to Black Sunday. Right here is the 100th meridian. From here west is where you're most likely to see the really severe dust storms that like we saw last spring. And there are a couple of factors that come into play with that. One of the things is that this is an area where you get a lot of strong winds. There are very few obstructions to that, so you get winds that are carrying over a very long distance. You get a clash of air masses, which help increase that wind. It's in a lower rainfall area. And the soil types out here are all of a nature that are very fine and very prone to blowing. And so that um, makes all of the factors together to make it some of the worst areas for, for dust storms. And indeed, when we talk about dust storms, the dust bowl is what people generally think of. And this is the area right down here that was the center or heart of the dust bowl. The term dust bowl was made popular by a Associated Press reporter named Robert Geiger, who was reporting on a terrible dust storm April the 14th, 1935 in Guymon, Oklahoma. And of course, that was the day that was known as Black Sunday. And this is what he said and what he wrote. Three little words, achingly familiar on a Western farmer's tongue is now a rule of life in the Dust Bowl in the center of the continent, if it rains. Some of the time we'd say, well, the dirt's coming from Oklahoma today. And it would, it was so red, it would just be red because there is a place between here and Oklahoma, you know, the dirt is. And it, at first we'd think it was rain, but we'd soon find out it was dust, dirt. I, they always talk about the dust, but I said it was the dirty 30s. It was dirt. Dad farmed quite a bit of ground at that time. We had five quarters. And um, it was, uh, we were raising some pretty good crops until between 24 and 31, and then they began to get the drought. And we were also responsible for this blowing by the method in which we were farming at that time, as were the rest of them. The stubble was high enough, these uh, disc one ways wouldn't cut through to the ground. So everybody used a match and burned it off and then worked the ground. We lost all the vegetation and the material that holds it together. So it became a powder, easily blown. 
and that was, I think, that was one of the big things. In addition to that, uh, droughts. There was a substantial influx of mechanization in farming in, uh, in the 1920s, especially in this part of the state. The advent of the tractor, uh, the advent of harvesting equipment uh, allowed for substantial, extensive acreage being put into production. Uh, much of this uh, new land was uh, owned by outsiders, by uh, investors, uh, folks called suitcase farmers who uh, came into the area and uh, uh, farmed and, and leased land and just came in time to collect the, the uh, rental payments and their share of the crop, if any. Uh, and so it was a kind of exploitive, I think, um, approach to farming here in Kansas thinking of it less as something to be conserved and something more to be exploited. We were pretty proud of ourselves. We could, the three boys were on the tractors and we could handle a quarter a day. So we weren't out on the field a whole lot, uh, a lot of time like the neighbors. <laughs> so we, were fair, we were fairly proud of ourselves, but dad also had acquired extra land, so we were, we were still occupied. The picture was not all that great in the 1920s, and of course that affected communities. It affected banks, which are pretty fragile institutions in small uh, rural uh, communities. So that um, the, when the stock market crash did occur, uh, by and large, uh, Kansans in the rural areas, certainly in the western part of the state, um, had their uh, difficulties. Furthermore, as a consequence of World War I, there was a substantial um, land speculation boom in southwestern Kansas. As uh, farmers and speculators came in and uh, carved up increasing acreage that had been in grassland and turned it into farm production. Um, so that 1930, 1931, the, uh, particularly in southwestern Kansas, the Dust Bowl area of our state, uh, the, um, the production was quite good. Um, the difficulty was that beginning in 1932, um, drought ensued. And so the drop in farm production was uh, enormous. I remember looking at Haskell County in, uh, in southwestern Kansas. They harvested something like um, 3.4 million bushels of wheat in 1931. 1932, about 10% of that number in 1933, maybe 90,000 bushels, so that within a two-year period, production just just plummeted uh, with, of course, the consequent implications for, for farmers and communities. The price of wheat fell uh, to 33 cents a bushel in 1931, and this is down from uh, much higher prices during World War I. And in World War I, it was patriotic to win the war with wheat, and over a million acres of Kansas land were put into wheat production. A lot of this was marginal land, uh, land that probably should have never been plowed up with very, very thin topsoil. Wheat fell to, to 31 cents in 1933. And at that point, um, a lot of people, especially if they had debt on their land, found that they could not even pay their taxes. 75% uh, of all the farms in Greeley County were delinquent on their taxes in 1932. In the cities as well as in the rural part of the world, uh, the United States it just kind of fell apart and it didn't really matter what was happening globally or even nationally. What, um, what mattered to people was the fact that um, they weren't making money, that banks were foreclosing on their property. Um, uh, people weren't necessarily concerned with politics when uh, they didn't even have a bathtub to take a bath in. Uh, the thing, uh, people got hit economically so hard so quickly that it really made society real. My dad tells us that the financial impact of the crash didn't really reach the central part of the country until about 31 or 32. And it landed there at the same time as the drought years and together they were devastating to the whole community. But the communities rallied, I think, and supported one another in many ways. My dad was in charge of the Red Cross for the whole county while he was there, and he has some interesting stories of tasks that were presented to him for which he felt quite unprepared, but the, because people stepped in, 
when my sister was born, my parents were unable to pay the hospital bill. And when it was time to pay the bill, they found that somebody else had slipped in and paid it for them. And that was the way life went, that people just helped each other out at that time. I like the Depression. Three years ago, I never had time to go to church for I was sort of taking up golf with some city fellers. And besides, I was so darn smart that there wasn't any preacher in southwest Kansas who could tell me anything. Now, I'm going to church regularly, and I like it. If this depression keeps up, I may be going to prayer meeting before long. Cry all you want to, but I'm enjoying this depression, and I don't give a hang who knows it. If I go broke, I'm going to have lots of good company. If I don't, I'm going to be awful lonesome. Whether school keeps or not, I'm getting my money's worth out of my last vote for president, and I like the depression. AGN, the Morton County Farmer, May 20th, 1932. We certainly didn't have any money. We just lived on what we had. We had our meat, you know. We had our, we had our beef, we had our pork, we had our eggs and our milk and our butter. We lived on what we what we made. And all of us, everybody in the community, we were all alike. I mean, wasn't anybody that had, we were all in the same boat, I guess you should say. My parents had come to the Oklahoma Panhandle in 1921, and they had the farm half paid for. But for seven years, we didn't raise any wheat at all, not a wheat crop. And of course, my father finally couldn't make the payments, and so we were bank foreclosed. And uh, we then moved to a little town that no longer exists, about six miles from our farm, so I could go to school. And the Baptist church could no longer afford a minister, so we lived in the Baptist parsonage. It was three rooms, no running water, electricity, and it was worth about what we paid for it, which was $5 a month. The advantage was it was close to the the area where my dad had gotten a job with the WPA to work on the roads. They were hard times. My, as I mentioned, my grandmother was an optometrist. I can remember that uh, some of her patients, uh, they would, they used a barter system a lot. And uh, I can remember we uh, would have maybe milk delivered that, uh, and she would take care of their family, uh, they didn't have the money, just wasn't there as much. And uh, you do this for me and I'll do that for you uh, was a, a way of life back then. Uh, my mother worked. She worked uh, at Armour Creameries, which was uh, down on the corner of 7th and Main. It was a big three-story building and they uh, had poultry, eggs, and uh, uh, made butter, and she worked in the office there as, uh, as secretary, bookkeeper, for a number of years. So uh, financially, we were not well off, but yet we were uh, financially sound and, and got along quite well. But there were a lot of people that suffered. Uh, I remember back in those days, uh, uh, we called them, of course, hobos, would come around, knock on the door for food. And then uh, they would also ride the, the rails in, uh, the homeless people. But uh, I remember quite a few of those coming around and, and uh, the folks would give them a handout. Of course, we didn't, being children, we didn't realize that we didn't have anything. We lived on a farm, so we always had a roof over our head and plenty to eat. But um, my grandmother sewed, and she made all my clothes, my coats, and everything. And when I started the high school, my mother took me to Ward's and bought me two dresses. And I was so proud to have a store-bought dress to go to school. <laughs> But everybody was in about the same circumstances, so. Nobody had anything. 
as far as money went. We had our a couple of milk cows and um, we had our fall hogs which we butchered and um, we had chickens. We had our eggs. As a result, we had our milk and butter and uh, Dad would go down and buy a ton of flour uh, at the flour mill in the start of the fall. And we put that up and, and so we had we had bread and we didn't starve, but um, we were quite fortunate and we were self-sufficient, really. My mother's savings, my mother had taught school for three years before she was married and her savings were in one of the two banks in Ellsworth and it crashed and so all of her savings were gone. A few years later, they got back some of it, about 50 cents on the dollar. But the other bank in Ellsworth did not crash because it had not given so many loans. I think the impact, the financial impact, in central Kansas anyway, one was that it was very hard to get a loan, and the other was if you had savings in a bank, you ran the risk of losing them. And if your means of income was based on the rainfall that didn't happen, it was disastrous. When the man would lose the farm, lose the house, there was often a huge change in his personality, in his point of view, in his um, participation level, in society, in his community, and especially within his family. Uh, there were many, many cases of uh, men going into severe depression, uh, seeking escape in alcoholism, seeking escape in leaving the family and leaving the, the wife to tend to fend for herself, trying to clothe the children, trying to put uh, f uh, food on the table, trying to find some way to make a living in the absence of the male breadwinner. So yes, they had not only to wash and to cook and to clean, but they had to also be the person, be the element that kept the family together. That was the woman's role, it fell to their lot. And that is a huge responsibility. And it's also very, very trying because on the one hand, you have a husband who feels inept, humiliated, defeated, and he's an adult, and you have five children who need to be supported and loved and tended to too, and a woman is torn. So I can only well imagine what goes on, what went on in a woman's heart and mind in trying to make the determination of where to lend most of her support. None of the calamity periods compare from the standpoint of financial loss, long-lasting distress, suffering, and discouragement with the decades of the 1930s. The Great Depression, which began in the fall of 1929, affected Kansas just as it did every other part of the country. But on top of it, there was superimposed almost a decade of drought and dust storms. In other words, Kansas and the neighboring Great Plains states got a double dose of misery and calamity. Congressman Clifford R. Hope. When they first hit it, just looked like a, a mountain caving in on you. You couldn't see anything. It was as dark as, as night. It, it was tough. Uh, it, it, was, it was bad. It just kind of like the world coming to an end. The daylight when it's doing it's uh, 12 o'clock noon, it was black outdoors, as dark as it could be. You could uh, see it coming. Uh, it was just like a wall. You would look out and you'd see this wall of dust. So you got where you were going or whatever, because you knew it was coming. Well, it was back in the early 30s, as I recall. Uh, and I can, I can still see in my mind those clouds coming in from the west. It looked like, today it looked like heavy rain clouds, but they were just dark clouds of dust that moved along and uh, just settled everywhere. And my dad has a story about how he was, he had been out visiting in the country and he was on the way home and he saw the black cloud that people keep talking about, the black cloud, arriving from the north. 
and he knew he needed to do something. So he stopped, he was driving an old Model T. He pulled over, he pulled the car over, and he got on the ditch, into the ditch, and lay in the ditch, like we have heard people doing sometimes for tornadoes, but this was just sheer dust storm, and the dust moved across him, moved across him. It did not blow the car away, and he was able to get up and come home, but my mother didn't recognize him when he got home because he was so covered with dust that she didn't know who it was. The worst day I remember uh, was in 1935, and the thing I remember about it is that the, the air was red with dirt, which meant, obviously, the dirt was coming from somewhere else. And I still remember that you couldn't see, we couldn't see a quarter of a mile down the road, it was so bad. My father used to say that when he came home from work, that he'd have to stop and read mailboxes to figure out where he was because it was that bad. It was like a heavy fog is that you'd see today. And I remember one time I went to town, which was Gold, about 10 or 11 miles from the farm, with my dad. And on the way home, a dust storm struck. And it was so thick, it did no good to turn the lights on. On the car, you could not see. And my dad would drive a few yards and then he'd stop and he'd get out and go around the side of the car and he'd feel around on the ground to see if we were still on the road. And then he'd get back in and drive a few more yards. That's a dust storm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went to a cousin that lived north of Luray for dinner on Sunday, one Sunday. I did all the driving because my, when we got the V8, it was just too quick and fast for my father to drive. And we went to this dinner at my cousin's. We just had dinner and uh, someone noticed there's a cloud coming up. And we knew then it was a dirt cloud. So dad said, I hate to just get up after I've eaten dinner and go home, but we better go home. And so he lived about five miles north of the uh, uh, this cousin lived five miles north of Luray, and so we all got in the car and left, and and uh, it was getting, it was really starting to blow. We stopped several times. On the way home that day, something kept a hitting the top of the car like hail, and it, uh, <laughs> come to find out, was it might have been hail because it was little mud balls. It was hit, and it was hard enough that you could hear it. And we were pretty dusty looking people when we got home, too, <laughs> with that. The cars were full of dust, and it, it was, that's how it was. About 32, uh, it was something terrible there where we lived. I think it was more where we lived than it was other people's because there's a bad, uh, two quarters of land right north of our house and it was bare all the way through and it got up a lot of speed <laughs> a lot of dirt and we have a little wash house just a little ways about two steps on cement walking across it and they, i went from the house to the wash house and come back in there and my face was just as black as it could get <laughs> well, I remember the dust storms, and I, we ourselves, our home was located real close to the creek. So we really, at home, never got the real drifting dust like a lot of them did. But you could always see it in the air, and later it kind of sift in, and you couldn't see the sun. And, and so forth. Now we had a family that come there one time. They were from Natoma. And it was a mother and her two daughters. The dirt got so bad they couldn't see to drive. And they drove down into our place. And then they called this girl's husband, Ever Slow, that lived on up the railroad. And him and the guy that was working for him they walked down the railroad, and we had our light where they could see, and they walked across and drove the rest 
that family to their homes in Natoma. One memory I have is uh, uh, three of us, uh, Byron Garver, a neighbor, and uh, Ed Coltman, who still lives here in Great Bend. Uh, the three of us went to a matinee at the, what was then the Plaza Theater there on Main Street. And we got out about, I'd say, maybe five o'clock in the afternoon and started walking home. We had just three blocks to walk, but literally you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. The dust and storm had come, and we were counting the blocks by the curbs as we stepped down. And I'm not exaggerating. My mother had a porch light on at the house, and I didn't see that light until I got up to the porch. It was just that heavy. It would, sometimes it would take a long time for it to, to reach us, you know, we could see the clouds in the distance and sometimes it would take a while to, for it to get there. We would have time to run to the cellar. The dust storms increased in frequency during the 1930s. They were first counted in 1932, uh, increased in frequency, uh, but really increased in frequency from 1936 through 1938. Um, the storms tended to last more than one day. Uh, sometimes they lasted numerous days. Uh, and if you combine that with the frequency of storms, you can imagine the, the impact. Um, most obvious, of course, would be the dust erosion, the wind erosion uh, that, that, were, that those storms would cause and over a number of years. One can only imagine the, the amount of topsoil that was blown away. I know when I came home from school, uh, at Omaha, we had, all we had of the dust storm up there was that it had come over and then the wind had died and it settled. We had dust over everything up there. At home, we had dust drifts that uh, we had a hedge about uh, 40 feet, 40 yards from the house, about 10 foot tall. And when I got home, all I could see was the tips of that of that uh, batch of uh, edge that had been there. It was buried. The fence that we had put up with the woven wire had caught thistles, and as a result, they were, the, f the fences were completely covered, or nearly completely covered. On the day that we call Black Sunday, he also got caught out in that and he said he absolutely couldn't see, couldn't tell where he was. Finally found the house, and we had gone to the neighbors to the cellar. And he said he had a hard time even finding his way around the house. It would be like it is now if we turn all the lights out in the middle of the night. The wind come up so strong, and it got up underneath the linoleum on the kitchen floor, and the, the carpet, the, Linoleum was just shaking up and down, you know, had all that air underneath it, and uh, it was kind of scary because <laughs> uh, the wind was blowing so hard. We had quite a few storms there in that area, at least seemed like to me. <laughs> to try to keep the dust out of the house, my mother put sheets over all the windows, the wet sheets, and then after the dust storm, while well, she'd take them, shake them all out, and wash them, and then hang them back up because. We had several of those dust storms. And I thought, you know, those homes at that time, they, were, they weren't very tight. And the dust would sift in and around the crack, in cracks around the doors and the windows. And my mother would take old socks and stuff all of the cracks in the door to try to keep the dust from sifting in. And it still got in. So when uh, I was supposed to set the table for a meal, I was instructed to put the plates on upside down so that then they sat that way until everybody got to the table and then you turned your plate over and mm -hmm. served yourself. That was how bad it was. I remember the stock tanks would get dirty and dust in them, cattle wouldn't drink, horses wouldn't drink, and after the storms we had to drain those tanks and and scoop the mud out of the bottom of them. Hog troughs would fill up with dirt and chicken troughs would fill up with dirt. We had to clean all that stuff up again. My grandfather 
took a rope and run it from the house to their barn so they could get back and forth and not get lost because you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. But I do remember the dirt blowing every day and it was very bad in the panhandle. Uh, I know that Cimarron County was worse than Beaver County but probably not a lot. Um, the road directly east of our house blew full of dust from one fence row to the other and it's never been opened. Still a closed road. Almost have to take a scoop <laughs> to kind of get it out so that then you'd scrub and clean it and wax the floor. And once I was doing that and, and uh, one of the neighbor men came in there and he just started laughing at me at doing that. He said, what's the use to do that? And, but anyway, I had it clean for probably that night. And then the next day it was the same thing again. And we never had any broken windows, but it just, that dirt some way would just get in the windows and it just pull the curtains clear down, you know, and blinds, it just tore them down. <laughs> but the window wouldn't be broken, but it just seemed like it could get in. Well, you plugged up the windows. It was about the biggest thing you could do hang sheets down over them or in where you two come together while you could stuff rags and stuff in there. But we never had a, a lot of dirt in our house because we had alfalfa and pastures away from us. So we were pretty well protected. My dad was kind of a poor farmer and uh, his land never blew. He, he kind of let the weeds kind of take over. We planted wheat most of the time in the weeds and, and the, dad's land never did blow. But the neighbors right north of us did. And one time the neighbor land was blown. He told my dad that if he could put some feed in that land that's blowing, there was 80 acres, he could plant it to keep it from blowing. So the dad did that and got a pretty good crop. We bound it and we shocked it and, and dust storms came and just filled those shocks up. And cattle wouldn't even eat it. <laughs> we, they, then it got some moisture in it. It was just like digging it out of mud. Had to burn this stuff, what, we, what was left over. We just set a torch to it. They had, we had a carpet. You couldn't see the design. It was like a 9 by 12 and then varnish around the edge. <laughs> you couldn't tell. The floor was covered with just dirt, dust, how it got in there so thick. I do not know. We did travel uh, in the summertime. Uh, we had relatives in Colorado, out in Denver and Inglewood. And uh, every summer around August, we'd go out there to visit. I can recall driving through western Kansas, the fence rows, the tumbleweeds would collect against the fence and the dust then, it would just look like a mound of dirt. And I can even recall some farm equipment out in the field that was almost covered with dirt or dust that had accumulated. Uh, it was just that bad. That was in the days of the WPA, and they built a small dam north of our farmhouse. And one day, when the men were working, a dust storm was coming in, and the men who had cars got in their cars and took off for home. But there was one man who didn't have a car, and my parents tried to persuade him he should stay all night. And he said no, his wife would be terribly worried. So he borrowed a horse to ride, and he took off north. In about a half hour, he was back because he just, he couldn't tell where he was. And he had just given the horse her head and let her bring him back. And I remember his telling us this wild story. He said the dust was so thick that he saw a squirrel up in the air digging a hole. We had problems with uh, grasshoppers at one point. They were so thick that, you, you know, for instance, the pitchfork handles, if you didn't, stick them into the stack. You go in for dinner, come back out, and the handles, instead of being smooth, were rough. 
And to use them, you get blisters. Is rough enough? You get blisters on the hands. The grasshoppers were eating the handles enough uh, to for salt, to get salt and so forth. That was um, a big problem to them. One person was telling about uh, them running a batch of grasshoppers, kind of moving them into an area, threw kerosene on them and set a match to them, burned a batch of them. So it would be quite a large number of grasshoppers. Along about 35 or 6, there was an awful lot of grasshoppers uh, that took the crops. But there was a year or two that you didn't raise very much to feed stuff. There was people that had to get rid of their stock and all in, in through there. Now rabbits cleaned up all the vegetation that came up in between they and the grasshoppers. So anything that was green was gone very, very shortly. And um, the counties got together and started in with the rabbit drives. They would get volunteers and just start out in about a four, a four or five mile circle. And they'd be able to deposit them along the line in that circle. At the head of the circle, they'd already built a pen and wings on it. To, yeah. So they'd start coming in and making noise and thumping. The rabbits would be running ahead of them. And then they drove the rabbits into this enclosure. And all of them carried a club, no firearms. And um, they uh, get them in the, in the uh, enclosure. And then it was just plain slaughter. With, with the clubs. Now I was under, wondering what happened to the dead rabbits and so forth. I was told that some of them, that some of them were shipped back to New York and were used as food, but I would think probably they were used for uh, dog food and cat food and that type of thing because they would not be fresh after that period of time, even though it was winter. It would not be. Uh, it would not be fresh, but those drives cleared out a tremendous number of rabbits all over the West there, and they were quite prolific and uh, in number. I I remember the jackrabbits and the, the jackrabbit. I guess they call them runs where the bunch of y'all get together and line up a bunch of rabbits, and then they'd get in there and club them to death. I never did do that. I, I didn't even want them on our land when, when they were doing that. That was, I, I couldn't take that. <laughs> if they shot them, that was okay, but I hated to see them club them. People would respond uh, in their diaries and journals and reminiscences that they hated the sound of the rabbits as they were clubbed to death within the circle of, of hunters. Uh, that rabbits, you know, shriek rather disgustingly at the end of their lives. And so uh, people, st I've heard women say that they still wake up at night with that sound of those dying rabbits in their ears. Of course, they were little kids and that would make a, a huge impact on them. But as one farmer commented, uh, you can only imagine what the SPCA today would think of clubbing uh, rabbits, rabbits to death. Most farmers, when they decide to leave their farms, load their household possessions in trucks or trailers and take to the highway under power. Many of the townspeople, having no means of transport, are forced to abandon their property and leave on foot with only the clothes on their backs and such bundles as may be carried in their hands. After every storm, the highways are thronged with these refugees. On the roads running through Mead and Montezuma, I have seen hundreds of people in endless possession heading out of the Dust Bowl. So it was in 1934, in 1935, in 1936, in 1937, and in 1938. Thousands of families deserting towns and farms, all seeking some haven of relief from the dust. Lawrence Savodbida, Dust Bowl survivor. In 1938, Roy Cramel, of the Special Coordinator of, on the Dust Bowl for the federal government, estimated that the Great Plains was losing 850 million tons of soil 
a year in the dust storms. The year, worst year was 1935, when there were 53 major dust storms. Uh, the stress on people was tremendous. Um, for example, in Morton County, near Rolla, there were two tragic murder-suicides that occurred within a month of each other uh, in January and February 1935. My father, uh, I don't know that he became an alcoholic, but he, like other uh, men who lost everything, began to drink. And I thought about that a lot uh, because I've written some books about my area at the number of people, men, who drank and who later quit which told me they weren't really alcoholics, but it was a way to escape the humiliation of losing everything. That must have been terrible. I was so little it didn't affect me that way, but <clears throat> I know my father was always humiliated by that. If you have uh, dust storms lasting three or four days uh, continuously, uh, lifting the rafters of the ceiling of the roof, for example, what does that do uh, to, to individuals? Uh, what does it do to folks who uh, who are religiously oriented and perhaps see this uh, as signs of God's displeasure. Uh, what can one do to uh, rectify one's relationship uh, with one's uh, uh, God? Um, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that the psychological and religious implications were significant as well for many folks. Uh, we lived in that little town a year and then we moved to a town uh, about 10 miles away and it was on a highway, on Highway 64. And every day we would see cars going west, old cars piled with everything this family owned, going to California or Washington or someplace like that. Um, I remember that well. A lot of them would stop and ask for something to eat. And even though we didn't have much money, my mother fed everybody. Sometimes it was just bread and butter sandwiches, but she always fed them. I, I remember, and I don't know of anyone that, that had this dust pneumonia, but uh, there was this uh, illness uh, caused by the dust that settled in, the, would get into the lungs, and if you breathed enough, enough of it, you'd uh, have kind of a, a pneumonia condition. And uh, I'm sure that there were people that were seriously ill with it. And in 1938, there was three or four deaths that they always said was the cause from dust pneumonia. Um, a lot of people did wear masks, uh, whether my mother remembers it or not. Her mother made her wear a mask, uh, and her sisters also recall being wear, uh, made to wear a mask to avoid that Oklahoma red dust. So even in Nebraska, people blamed Oklahoma for the Dust Bowl. But yes, uh, masks were common fare. You wore them when you went out, you wore them when you were in the garden, when you were on the way to church, when you're on the way to school. It was just a health precaution. The only thing I really remember is my dad saying to my mother, we would go to California too, but I don't know what I would do when I got there and we don't have a car that would make it. I'm sure that's the only reason we didn't. The county that I live, that we lived in, and I still live in that county, uh, at, that, at the beginning of the Dust Bowl had nearly 25,000 people. By the end of the Dust Bowl, it had 6,000. My mother was more eager to move than my dad was, but he said next year will be better. He, as I said, was an eternal optimist. These were situations, these were times that everybody felt, uh, and everybody was the same. The research that I've done, the people that I've interviewed from Illinois to Nebraska to Texas, everybody was in the same situation and it was not pleasant. And so there was this empathy, there was this support system. Um, it wasn't anything monetary, it wasn't anything tangible, but it was the, the sharing of hope, the sharing that certainly someday things will improve and if we can just hang out, hang in long enough, things will get better. That's all they had to cling to. I guess we were just hopeful for this rain all the time. And uh, we was kind of discouraged because of the, kept, it did never seem like it let up. How many we had, how long it lasted, I can't tell you because it just seemed like it was forever. <laughs> we just didn't give up our hope, I guess. We were always hoping. <laughs> God took care of us through all those storms, which is 
wonderful because it was really bad. <laughs> I remember I hired out for the Santa Fe Railroad in 1941. And I had a run from Dodge City to Boy City, Oklahoma. And that was a bad area during dust storms. And uh, we could still see places where the dust had banked up around the house just like snow. And there's times when I had to get off of that locomotive and shovel a path so that the locomotive could go through that drifts. Because they'll, they'll knock the locomotive right off. Well, my dad owned the farm, so you know, you just stayed and worked it out and did the best you could. I think they always thought things would get better. If not, I, I think they just accepted things and went day at a time. I remember one time we were, I think it was in Quint or at some sort of affair, I'm not sure what it was, and it started to rain a little bit and a lot of men said to their their kids, come on outside here. I want you to see something you've never seen before. <laughs> it was a little bit of rain. Those were hard times, but yet I look back upon them. I had a good childhood. And uh, in spite of that, I think that people uh, had a good attitude and uh, worked together made it through. Uh, I think the positive thing that came out of it was changed farming practices forever. It made us conscious of conservation and how to keep the land from blowing and keeping crops on it. And, oh yes, changed agriculture immensely. Ness County News had their headline and it, every paper that came out was uh, plant trees, build dams, and summer follow. That was the headlines of every one of the papers that they put out for a long time at home and before. And the conservation program that went on then under Roosevelt, they bought all kinds of trees and planted all kinds of trees. Many of them died, some of them too. And you begin to get some vegetation that was holding some of the dust and dirt and preventing the blowing. And uh, with the type farming that they was doing, uh, with the listers and uh, the damming, they were catching what moisture they had. And you're gradually getting grass and weeds and stuff back for vegetation to uh, reclaim the ground. Our unit started mainly as uh consequence of the Dust Bowl, severe wind erosion during the 30s. Then they developed a national program after World War II to do wind erosion research here in Manhattan, Kansas, in cooperation with Kansas State University. The U.S. government, in, in addition to establishing a research, wind erosion research center, they also instituted various programs. Some have been fairly recent, some have been uh, soon after the Dust Bowl, like the Great Plains Forestry Project, planting trees and windbreaks to reduce uh, wind speed in susceptible fields. One of the more recent programs uh, is called the Conservation Reserve Program. Land that is susceptible to erosion is planted to permanent vegetation. Another program that's become quite popular centered in, in Kansas is called No-Till on the Plains, residue from the previous crop, which protects that land against uh, both water and wind erosion. And then as, as irrigation has come into areas susceptible to wind erosion, it protects uh, the land of a couple of things, mainly the vegetation that is produced by the irrigation and also wetting the soil. So these farmers were uh, doing an excellent job under irrigation to protect against the ravages of wind erosion. Several years ago living in Hutch, 
I guess we were having kind of a drought. But one day I looked to the west and here was this great big thing of dust and I thought, no, we're not going back to that. But evidently it was just blowing fields because it didn't come in, but I, it sure took me back. I thought, well, it can't be starting again, but, and I don't think it, it would be because farming methods have changed so much. Sometimes when I'm asked the question, will we have another dust bowl, I, I, part of my answer is if the conditions were to repeat themselves, we would undoubtedly have erosion, but it would not be as, as severe as it was during the 30s. Farm practices have changed, reduced tillage, conservation reserve program, national grasslands, uh, forestry projects, shelter belt projects, and then results of research from our laboratory helping the farmers to decide what practices uh, will reduce the erosion to what extent. And so lots of things are, would uh, reduce the severity of erosion if the same conditions were to re reoccur. We've had a five-year drought that has been relieved with some rains that we've had last year, but you can go back and see um, geological evidence or ring tree evidence for droughts of a much longer time period. Um, there's evidence of droughts as long as 25 or 50 years. Uh, if you get that kind of an extended drought, there's every possibility that there will be a dust storm again. It's been very interesting that a lot of the conservation techniques that have been employed have reduced the vulnerability, but the likelihood of totally eliminating any possibility of that kind of storm, um, it's very, very slim. It may be much um, smaller in scale and much shorter in duration, but it's still likely to happen. There was a woman in uh, Cimarron County who uh, lost her husband during the Depression, and as a result of her husband's death, she lost the family farm. And so she was literally penniless, and so she thought, I'll see if I can scrounge around and see if I can get some money from a banker here or a friend there, and she started to sell Avon. And within 10 years, she had purchased a store in Boys City, Oklahoma that you can turn disaster into success. So there were people who didn't quail themselves off, who, who didn't seek solace in, uh, in escapism or in alcoholism. There were people who said, by golly, I'm gonna beat this any way I possibly can. And she had mouths to feed, she was a mother. So you can be very inventive when, uh, when you've got a, a baby crying in your arms. There were seven children in our family. I was the oldest girl. I had twin brothers four years older. So I got to do the housework and take care of the babies. And, uh, I worked harder as a child than I have since I was married. Because <laughs> my mother was, well, if you want to do something, she'd give you something to do, and if you didn't get it done, you couldn't do it. And you never said you were bored or didn't have anything to do because she could find something for you to do. I don't know, maybe your families were knit a little closer together. I think you've done a little more neighboring than what you do now. I guess it taught us to be independent and self-reliant. Uh, it also taught us to rely on other people, to trust other people. I'm still that way today, probably too trusting. Because we didn't lock our doors, we took our neighbor's word for whatever they said. That was a positive aspect of it. Well, I think it, it revealed the nature of the people that was already there, but it gave them the opportunity to help one another out. And there's something said about did the, did the uh, depression affect the lives of the, ch of the children? Uh, I do not think so, except maybe for the better, because that was a, remember the generation that went off uh, to war. I think really, I know that they, 
have managed to make this, our country, to the best time that it had ever had. Well, I stayed in this area until about 35 years ago, um, and I moved to Colorado, lived out there 25 years, and chose to come back because my family is in this area. And unlike a lot of people, I happen to love the Panhandle. I like it a lot. I like the people most of all, but I also like the land we live on and the history behind it. This program is funded in part by the Kansas Humanities Council, a nonprofit cultural organization promoting understanding of the history, tradition, and ideals that shape our lives and build community.